Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Jason Freeman, Author Events Office, Jack of All Trades, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to introduce Anna Bodkin and Min Jin Lee. With what the Christian Science Monitor calls rich and lucid prose that illustrates her journey as vividly as might a series of photographs, Anna Bodkin is renowned for using an artist's eye to offer a ground-level view of people in extreme circumstances around the world. Her immersive investigations of the world's inequities uh, and inequities uh, have yielded six books of nonfiction. Most recently, The World is a Carpet, Four Seasons in an Afghan Village, and Walking with Abel, Journeys with the Nomads of the African Savannah. A contributor to Foreign Policy, The New York Times, and The New Republic, she won the Joel R. Selden Award for documenting the lives of civilians in war zones. In Fisherman's Blues, Bodkin documents the cultural, economic, and environmental toil in a centuries-old Senegalese fishing village. How, she asks, does the shifting demarcation line between earth and sea define the way we see the world, shape our community, and communality? Also with us tonight is Min Jin Lee, author of the novel Free Food for Millionaires, a, culture, uh, a story of culture clash and identity that was named to a number of 2007's uh, best of the year list and praised as accomplished and engrossing by the New York Times Book Review. She is a former columnist for the Chosen Ilbo, South Korea's leading newspaper, and her fiction essays and articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Vogue, and Food and Wine, among many other places. A National Book Award finalist and New York Times bestseller, Lee's newest novel tells the generation-spanning story of a Korean family's fight for purchase in 20th century Japan. Just the title of the review in the Irish Times says it all. It reads, quote, Pachinko Review, a masterpiece of empathy, integrity, and family loyalty. Here to tell us more about it, ladies and gentlemen, please first welcome Welcome Min Jin Lee to the Free Library of Philadelphia. First of all, I want to thank you for coming tonight. And I also want to thank Jason. Where did he go? He just disappeared. Anyway, I want to thank him for this introduction. I feel also really lucky to be here with Anna, whose work I really admire. She's an incredible writer, so I feel very lucky to be here. I also wanted to just say one thing, is that very often when libraries ask me to come by, I could never say no. It's really hard because I first came to America in 1976. I was seven and a half years old. Oh, there's Jason. Jason, thank you. <laughs> um, I came when I was seven and a half years old. English is my second language. And when I first got here, we lived in Elmhurst, Queens. And for those of you who don't know, it's a very posh neighborhood. But they had this really fantastic library, the Elmhurst Public Library, and that is pretty much where I lived. I have two sisters, and they're both really gregarious and very easy to acclimate to the new country, but I had a great difficulty in learning how to speak, not just English, but just learning how to talk with other people my own age. I think elementary school girls and middle school girls were an entire puzzle to me. They're probably a puzzle to you, too. But I really had a really difficult time, but librarians just sort of took me in and they took care of me and they gave me books and I eventually learned how to read and write and learn how to speak. So I hope that you will always support this incredible library because libraries are the first stop for those who are without friends, for those who are without means, and it is where people like me grow up to become writers. So I want to thank you for supporting the library. I'm only going to read for about six and a half minutes because I want you to like me. It's really quite simple. <laughs> I'm going to read toward the latter part of the book. And in this part, you know, it's a novel. We are going to be in 1976. The book actually starts around 1890, almost. Um, but I'm going to read from 1976. We're in Yokohama, so we are not at this gorgeous library in Philadelphia. We are in Yokohama. And I would like you to do what we readers do best. I would like for you to imagine with me. And in this scene, 
we have three characters that we can be mindful of. We have Moses, who is a pachinko parlor owner. We have his son Solomon, who is a young teenage boy. And we have Etsuko, who is a Japanese woman who owns a restaurant and who dates Moses. So we have Moses, pachinko parlor owner, Solomon, his son, and we have Etsuko, the Japanese restaurant owner. We are at a government office in Yokohama. It is 1976. The Yokohama Ward Office was a giant gray box with an obscure sign. And the first clerk that they saw was a tall man with a narrow face and a shock of black hair buzzed off at the sides. And he stared at Etsuko shamelessly, his eyes darting across her breasts, her hips, and her jeweled fingers. She was overdressed compared to Moses and Solomon, who wore white dress shirts, dark slacks, and black dress shoes. They looked like the gentle Mormon missionaries who used to glide through her village on their bicycles when she was a girl. Your name, the clerk squinted at the form that Solomon was filling out. Soromono. What kind of name is that? It's from the Bible. He was a king and the son of David, a man of great wisdom. My great uncle named me. And the boy smiled at the clerk as if he was sharing a secret. He was a very polite boy, but because he had gone to school with Americans and foreigners, sometimes he said things that a Japanese person would never have said. Soramon. King, great wisdom. Koreans don't have kings anymore. What did you say? Etsuko asked. And quickly, Moses pulled her back. And she glanced at Moses. His temper was far worse than hers. Once, when a restaurant guest had tried to make her sit with him, Moses, who happened to be there that night, walked over, picked him up bodily, and threw him outside the restaurant, breaking the man's ribs. She was expecting no less of a reaction now. But Moses averted his eyes from the clerk, and he stared at Solomon's right hand. And Moses smiled. Excuse me, sir. We're in a hurry to return home because it's the boy's birthday. Is there anything else we should do? Thank you very much for understanding. And confused, Solomon turned to Etsko and she flashed him a warning look. And the clerk pointed to the back of the room and told Moses and Etsko to sit down. And Solomon remained standing opposite the clerk. And in the long rectangular room, shaped like a train car, the, with bank teller windows running parallel alongside opposite walls, half a dozen people sat on benches reading their newspapers or manga. And Etsko wondered if they're all Korean. And Moses sat down, and then he got up again. And he asked if Etsko wanted a can of tea from the vending machine. And she nodded yes. She felt like slapping the clerk's face. In middle school, she had once slapped a gossipy girl. And it had been very satisfying. And when Moses returned with their tea, she thanked him. You must have known. You must have warned him, ne? I mean, you told him that today would not be so easy. And 
after the words came out of her mouth. They sounded harsh, and she felt sorry. No. No, I didn't say anything to him. He opened and closed his fists rhythmically. I came here with my mother and my brother for my first registration papers. And the clerk was nice, normal. So I asked you to come. I thought maybe having a woman, a Japanese woman, by him might help. And Moses exhaled through his nostrils. It was stupid. It was so stupid to wish for kindness. Oh no, no. You couldn't have warned him. I shouldn't have said it like that. It is hopeless. I cannot change his fate. He is Korean, and he has to get those papers, and he has to follow all the steps of the law perfectly. Once, at a ward's office, a clerk told me that I was a guest in his country. You and Solomon were born here. Yes. My brother Noah was born here too. And Moses covered his face with his hands. Anyway, the clerk wasn't wrong. And if this is something that Solomon must understand, we can be deported. We have no motherland. Life is full of things that he cannot change. So he must adapt. My boy has to survive. And Solomon returned to them. And next he had his photograph taken, and afterward he had to go to another room to get fingerprinted, and then they could go home. The last clerk was a pretty woman with a long ponytail, and she took Solomon's left index finger and gently depressed it into a pot filled with thick black ink. And Solomon placed his finger onto a white card as if he was a child painting. And Moses looked away, and he sighed audibly. And the clerk told Solomon to pick up his registration card in the next room. Let's get your dog tags, Moses said. Solomon faced his father. Hmm? It is what we dogs must have. And the clerk looked furious suddenly. The fingerprints and the registration cards are vitally important for our government records, and there is no need to feel insulted by this. It is an immigration regulation required for foreign, and Etsco stepped forward. But you don't make your children get fingerprinted on their birthday, do you? And the clerk's neck turned red. My son is dead. And Etsuko bit her lip. She didn't want to feel anything for this woman, but she knew what it was like to lose her children. And it was like you were cursed and nothing would ever restore the desolation of your life. Koreans do a lot of good things for this country, Etsuko said. They do the difficult jobs the Japanese don't want to do. They pay taxes, they obey laws, and they raise good families, and they create jobs. You Koreans always tell me this. And Solomon blurted out, she's not Korean. 
and Etsko touched his arm. And the three of them walked out of the building and she wanted to crawl out of this gray box and see the light of outdoors again. She longed for the white mountains of Hokkaido. And though she had never done so before, she wanted to walk in the cold, snowy forests beneath the flanks of the dark, leafless trees. In life, there was so much insult and injury. And she had no choice but to collect what was hers. But now, she wished to take Solomon's shame and add it to her pile, though she was already so overwhelmed. Thank you. I just wanted to say that that chapter is the only chapter that survived um, 20 years because I got the idea for this book in 1989. I wrote an entire version between 1996 to 2003 and what I just read to you is the only section that survived the entire manuscript which I had to throw away. It was very horrible. And the new book that I wrote, which is Pachinko right now, I wrote it between the years 2007 and 2016. And that chapter, the, the part of the scene that I read to you was really important because it was the distillation of maybe three or four academic books that I had to read in order to understand immigration law about fingerprinting. So I was really happy that it survived. But anyway, I want to turn this floor to my dear friend, Anna. Thank you for coming, trudging through snow. Um, Fisherman's Blues is a book about my friends and hosts in Senegal in an artisanal fishing port called Joal, which is the largest artisanal fishing port in Senegal, where fishing is the third um, largest source of uh, currency. Uh, and I lived in Joal for um, eight months to uh, work on artisanal fishing pirogues uh, as, a f as a fisherwoman, as a decky, uh, which is about the lowest rung on a boat, basically bailed a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, the purpose of my work was to um, explore boundaries. I grew up in the Soviet Union, uh, so behind the Iron Curtain, I um, worked as a war correspondent for 15 years, uh, boundaries, personal boundaries, physical boundaries, um, boundaries of desire, how we draw them, how we abide by them has always uh, held a fascination for me. So I thought um, I'd like to explore uh, the foremost boundary, what I thought was the foremost boundary, the boundary between the solid, the terra firma, and the ineffable, the unfathomable ocean. Thought I, thinking that that's something that is drawn in the sand. Um, and so I went to live with people who have been traversing or who tra traverse that boundary daily, um, only to find out that that boundary is just as elusive as any boundaries withdraw. Axion was an upa on a purse net pirogue that slipped her mooring during the night and drifted to sea. In the morning, he swam out to fetch her. They look for him all day. In gill netters, in purse saners, in trap setters unsuited to the vigor of the outgoing riptide, the wooden boats daubed in primary colors like some maritime adaptation of clown's wagons. The desperate crews lean overboard to stare at a sea that is all surface. Maybe suddenly the sun slants just so, and in a boat's shadow the seabed shines up from ten fathoms below, clear and pale, speckled with colonies of mussels and clams and rocks. I have seen this happen. Then the boat turns, the ocean surface curtains, and the vision is gone. 
They have no net large enough to dredge the sea. The day Axion drowns near Jefer, the tide in Joal casts ashore a man so decomposed that the only certain thing about him is that he was a fisherman. The corpse is wearing a green slicker and beige rubberized overalls. They bury him as soon as they find him right on the beach. This often happens when men die at sea, say fishermen who play cards in the eucalyptus shade between the hospital and the weather advisory flagpole by Mbar Sarene. Been in the water too long, too rotten to take to the cemetery. Such graves line the coast, they say. There was one right there, under that flagpole, see? I look, the flag flops yellow, warns of troubled seas. But that grave is gone now. Where we buried that man, the sea took it. Now he's in the ocean. Between here and the Filao Grove, we probably buried 10 people, more than that, maybe more than that. I don't remember his name. I don't think we ever knew his name. Life is so. Come on, it's your turn now. The men resume their card game, Belote, a game of tricks. The wind smells of eucalyptus and raw fish. Bougainvillea branches droop over the stucco walls of white people's vacation homes. The sea is never pregnant, a wall of proverb goes. You can never predict when it will deliver. You can never predict what it will take either. To live off the sea is to submit to its vagaries, to endure constantly the tension between desire and defeat. I go looking for the grave of the man who washed up in the morning. I walk toward the weather flag and then turn south along the tide line. Spring tide under a roiling sky, black, black surf. I study the shoreline, the shipwreck of it. A collage of windblown jacaranda blossoms, fishnet tangles, turtle excrement, brown plastic cups, fish heads, styrofoam floats studded with barnacles, fish hooks, and bird bones caught in bales of maroon seaweed that is used to make an additive that clarifies your beer and stabilizes your toothpaste. Watch this elastic line erode. The onshore winds of the rainy season, warm, humid, oily with salt, abrade the adobes of Joal, winnow bricks out of their sockets. After a few years, houses begin to look cellular, like honeycombs. Pause by the wall of my rental room, you can see minuscule white granules weather out in faint diaphanous streams, sand seeping back into sand. You can hear them. Or much louder in Palmaran, in Joal, in Saint Louis, where entire walls crash down onto the beach. Then the offshore winds of the dry season come, push Africa into the ocean, grain by grain. I pass a pack of dogs gnawing a dead goat. There is something terribly wrong with all the dogs here, the mangy, short-haired yellow mutts that roam the tide, town's tideline and sleep in pirogue's shade. They're broken, ripped up, maggoty around the ears and snouts. They skulk. When they lie in the road, they barely raise their heads at passers-by. I am told they are mongrel descendants of the dogs the Portuguese slave traders brought along. A friend corrects me. The strays are probably Laube, an indigenous West African breed. Does it make any difference? The story is out. One way or another, the curs have become mnemonics for an unforgivable iniquity. A skinny man follows me from the Belote game. His name is Sering Falu, like the second Murid Khalif. Sering Falu, are you a fisherman? 100%. By the way, the nearest grave is between here and that Mbar. I helped bury the man in that grave, but the sea took it. At Mbar Sarene, men mend net under a roof thatched with palm fronds. We salam them, explain our quest, they respond by joking that a man who has only one wife will go to hell after death, ha ha ha. And a man who dies a bachelor will burn in eternal fire, ha ha ha. Many things on the shore seem non sequiturs to me. Sering Falu continues his guided tour of the mariner's purgatory. There was another one over there. We didn't know him. We found him in the sea. 
I helped bury him too, but the grave is no longer here. The sea took it. The sand is crusty above the tide line, striated with scrapings of crabs. Under our footfalls, it collapses, implodes. I think of drowning, its irrevocable and crushing loneliness. How many fishermen have you helped bury? Maybe 10. Does it make it hard for you to go fishing? Not really. I've seen so many dead fishermen by now, it doesn't really bother me. Sitting Falu did not see this morning's corpse. His neighbor found it. We telephoned the neighbor, but he does not want to come to the shore to show us the spot. No, that would feel ghastly. It was ghastly in the morning already. The body was completely decomposed. It was lying face down in the sand. All the hair was gone from its skull. Sitting Falu peels off. I go on looking. Suddenly before me is a geyser. Thousands of creamy white butterflies are hatching out of a nopal grove. The butterflies are a banded gold tip, Colotis aris aris. They're native to Senegal. Nopal is an American transplant, another relic of the slave trade. I recall a poem, say the lines out loud, so in the undergrowth they came together, butterflies and the bones of the dead. It is okay to recite Neruda on the beach. On the tide line a few dozen yards away, a young athlete in a white singlet and blue gym shorts is singing too in English, wanna make up right now, na na. The fruit is ripe. I pick one, roll it in the sand with a broken symbium shell to shuck the spines. On both sides of the ocean, prickly pear stains fingertips with juice that runs blood red. I eat, I watch the butterflies, I continue down the shore. Then I see a grave in the Filao Grove, an elliptical shape topped with broken murex shells and trimmed with broken bricks. And then an unmarked bump in the sand cinched by dune creepers that reach their tendrils toward the ocean. And another trussed to the shore by weathered brambles. And another unmarked rise behind a young grove of Sodom's apples whose leaves offer protection against the genie that snatched the souls of newborn babies. And this, a bleached boneyard of long conch shells and two cracked brown plastic coffee cups, who lies here? Another and another. Are those burial mounds? Accidental sand drifts? It does not matter. The fisherman's grave is right here, remorseless, greedy, eternally lapping against the shore. Great mother of life, the sea, wrote Rachel Carson, the beginning and the end. I shudder, somewhere in the sea there is that man's hair. And the hair and the bones of all the dead whose graves the sea has taken, whom it has taken to the graves. Things on earth forever carry seaward. More than 9,000 cubic miles of water may flow into the sea each year, and with it, billions of tons of salts and millions of tons of plastic garbage and bones mixed in the currents of river water and groundwater migrating under our feet and paths and homes and kitchens. We're always walking on bones. I visit my neighbor, Mamour's second wife, Yasin. She is 28, a mother of four. Her body is long, flowing. She moves as if she is not serious about moving, as if every step is a joke, a tease she tosses at you. When she smiles, it is as if she knows a secret for which you are too young. Yasin greets me with that smile. Her hair is straightened with a blonde highlight. Her mermaid skirt is a pattern of large pink shrimp on a green field. She takes me by the hand and walks me through a submarine blue hallway and offers me a plastic chair to sit in. She takes one for herself. She leaves the front door open. Mamur is not home from fishing yet. She moves my chair so that I too can watch the door. While we drink sweet tea with mint, the western sea in the doorframe turns green, then purple, then the palest yellowish blue, then black. Mamour is very late today. Have you called him? Ha! He doesn't have a phone. 
She has called the harbor where boats unload their catch of the day. They said the Mansur Saho has not yet arrived. Actually, let me call again. No, not there yet. Finally, it is so dark, the sea is just a vastness beyond the compound walls, a thick indigo void. Yasin straps her nine-month-old girl, her youngest, to her back and moves her chair. In its place, at the farthest end of the hallway, under the portraits of Murid Khalifs, she lays a plastic mat and covers it with polyester blanket. She shucks off her sandals, steps onto the blanket, and begins to dance. Step, 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 step. It is for the baby, she explains, to quiet her down. But the girl, who is often whiny, has not made a sound this evening, not even a pout. Yasin dances facing the sea, long-limbed, slow-bodied, like a queen. Step, 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 step. She looks at the door. My God, I think she watches that door every day. It is past dinner time when a teenage boy walks in, one of her husband's crew. He took a taxi from the harbor. Thirteen boxes of sardine today, he reports. A good day. The pirogue is on her way home. Yasin just keeps on dancing. Step, step. Step, step. She does not change pace, does not take her eyes off the door. I have begun on evening walks to scan the moorings for familiar boats. A waitress in a small fishing village up coast takes my order. Grilled shrimp she recommends delicious, then tells me her husband died at sea. What do you do with such knowledge? Lying there on the table before you, the salt and pepper shakers, the placemat, the plate of peanuts, and this. Idiotically, self-servingly, you try to undo it, forces, force it impossible. She's much too young to have had a husband. No, no, madame, she laughs, gracious, firm, rejecting your insensitive offer to erase her loss. No, it is true. I have two children. One is already in first grave. I'll go tell the kitchen to get started on your order now, and you're left to fold and refold this new story of heartbreak like a napkin. Okay, I just realized how dark this is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, so, so most uh, most, pe most people on board a fishing boat in Senegal are very young, um, like twelve or twelve year old young uh, boys, um, usually children of of the captain. Um, and I'm going to try and lighten this up somehow. Uh, make it up to you. Um, uh, by reading a very short um, passage, if I can find it, um, about children. At six o'clock, three boys wearing blue jeans and blue t-shirts scrambled into the Mama Woli Chor, a 130-foot beached pirogues awaiting a paint job between the tide line and Barca Nene. They are brothers. The oldest is 10. They tie two lengths of line three inches thick to the purse saner's center thwarts, chuck the loose end over to port, rappel down. They knot thick figure eights at the bottom of the lines for seats. Then two of them straddle the knots and, coordinating their start times with the focus and seriousness of children at play, they begin to swing. I watch. Then I can no longer watch. May I? Of course. I hike up my skirt and mount one of the lines. That sweet delay in the diaphragm, the nag of the ribcage rushing ahead of the heart, that pelagic rocking, that imitated flight, that odd momentary deafness that comes with each forward thrust, sensations that seem remembered, recovered almost from way before the swings of my childhood. Like the recollection of Atlantis, the mysterious sunken continent that, had it ever been real, would have been what we now know as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, underwater for at least, at least 60 million years and so able to exist only in our pre-memory, cellular memory, the impression of being rocked by the ocean. I swing. 
The world ebbs and flows, flips. The pink glow of sunset flashes on a seagull's wing above, below. The soiree's unfinished pirogue swings in her dry dock upon the oscillating sand. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Daudasar's beached boat, the Stakombake. It is full of kids, and they jostle for the bowsprit, play king of the boat, yell, my boat, my boat, my boat, my boat. The shore is ravenously, outrageously alive. The kings of the boat laugh. The boat on the rope swing laugh. I laugh. I am a child. On the ocean, we all are forever suspended on its timeless, placeless swing. Thank you. I have a question for Min Jin. Anna, I wouldn't ask you a question. I haven't read your book yet. Um, but I'm wondering about Pachinko. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I have thought I knew something about Korea and Japan, but I didn't know this history the way that you told this, the, the history through the character stories was really remarkable and allowed me to experience that um, so that I have now a greater, much greater understanding. My question though is, has the book been translated to Japanese? Um, if it has, or even if it hasn't been translated to Japanese, how has it been received in Japan? What's your name? Um, my name is Hilary Banta. <laughs> Hilary, well first of all Hilary, thank you for reading the book. My mother thanks you. <laughs> my publisher and my agent, everybody. Um, it's really always remarkable when people have read this book because I never thought I would sell it. Uh, I worked on it for such a long time and after I finished it, I remember I went to my agent's office and she's from a very fancy building and I had all the pages printed out in this Kinko's box, which I had gotten for free. <laughs> and, I, and I think a really cool person would just send the PDF file but I had to carry it because I'm such an anxious person. So I carried it in the elevator and I thought to myself, if Suzanne Gluck cannot sell this book, then I will try to contact a very minor academic press and perhaps they will publish it for free. Because I did feel very confident about the scholarship of the book. So in that sense, I'm really <coughs> glad that I was able to share this history with you because it was so important to me that it was a scholarly piece of work. And I think that I was really excited to do this um, event today with Anna because I'm kind of a wannabe journalist. And that's how I work. I do all this scholarship and this research and then I do all these interviews and then I kind of try to put fiction together. Very stupid way to work, really. But anyway, to go back to your question about has it been translated into Japanese, it has not. It has not. It has sold to 23 countries and it has been received very well around the world. However, it has not yet sold to Japan. In Japan's defense, <laughs> why don't I defend Japan? Yes. <laughs> Instead of just wading into controversy willy-nilly. So in Japan's defense, I think they might be thinking that perhaps they have their own Korean Japanese writer. So why would they need me, a Korean American, to talk about the story? That said, there is no book like this written in Japanese right now. I know because I know what's there. This is the first book written originally in English for adults about the Korean Japanese ever. And I know because I've read everything now in English. I've been working on this book for 30 years. So next month, oh, interesting. Next month at Johns Hopkins, there's a symposium about Pachinko with uh, scholars coming around. So I got the A. I'm really, really excited. <laughs> but thank you for your question. Is, is fact checking, is, is that an easy or difficult thing um, in the circumstance? Has there been a response? Um, I, I mean, I lived in Joal, right? So, um, so this is a, you know, this S is this, is a tremendous. These are two very uh, thoroughly reported um, books. Right. Uh, I'm taking a Fisherman's Blues on book tour to Senegal next month, oh, wow. uh, which is a first for me because most of the, so all the other books I've written, I've not been able to bring back to the people who helped me um, learn them um, because most of them are set in war zones. 
Uh, and Senegal so far, alhamdulillah, is not a war zone. Um, I'm going in April, I have three readings. Um, the readings will be in English. My friends don't speak English. So my dream would be, um, if I had a dream for this book, it would be to translate it into Wolof and to publish it immediately as an audio book, not as a print book, because my friends also don't read in Wolof. Um, very few people do. Um, there are brave um, writers in Senegal who are publishing now works in Wolof as part of decolonization of the mind, but um, still people are much, it's a much more of an auditory culture. Um, but that, not yet. Um, so I'm going to have to hand the book over to my friends and say, you know, trust me as you have trusted me before. Um, this is a book that came out of our um, journeys together. Uh, and hopefully they're benevolent and kind to me as they have been until now. I'm, I'm a political theorist by training, uh, but uh, I had a scholarly paper uh, on Korean Japanese, which I wrote about more than five years ago, and I just set aside that, that work until I found this book, Pachinko, and this book really uh, gave my work uh, a new life, and that I, I thank. I'd like to thank Bin Jin Lee, and I, I, have, I have a very simple question. Uh, who is your favorite character? And, and which character is the one like you now think, oh, I, I could have developed more and I uh, could have you know, worked on more? Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Jimon. I think we're Twitter friends. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I follow you. <laughs> and I follow you. <laughs> Uh oh. I know. I think Twitter is hilarious because you kind of have these weird dialogues with people, but you're kind of, you just can't connect the person and the thing that they say. And for the most part, I've been in a very happy Twitter space. Like I have no complaints about Twitter because I don't really engage politically. Like my work is political, so then I always kind of think I don't have to get into it too much. But going back to your question about my favorite character, my favorite character is Hansu. And everybody always gets really upset about that. They're like, how could you like this horrible monster, villain person who beats up women? And I always say, well, I'm a fiction writer. I need difficult characters. And I interviewed a lot of people like Hansu. And they were so sexy. <laughs> so I have a confession to make is that I'm a feminist and I have written about feminism for almost all of my life and I really believe in the self-determination of women around the world and throughout time and history and I want to correct this. However, there are times when I kind of want to be rescued. <laughs> Just a confession. <laughs> and you know, it's like, kind of like, oh, could someone please fix that dishwasher, please? Like, I don't want to learn how to fix that dishwasher. <laughs> And if a man walked in and could fix it, I'd just be like, oh my God, my hero. There's a little bit of that. And I think when I interviewed all these Hansu type people, they were so able to just move the dial, just kind of get shit done. And I did find that to be really appealing. <laughs> so I loved writing about him because he was a composite of many different alpha males that I had met in my interviews. And it's not necessarily always a physical thing, but a kind of power is very sexy. So my advice to women always, or to anybody really, is don't sleep with Hansu. <laughs> Must not do. <laughs> do not bear children with Hansu. However, he's really appealing, and you can feel the heat off of these bodies when you're with people like this. You're like, oh my god, they're really intoxicating. So that's my favorite character. <laughs> How did you happen to uh, be interested in this subject matter? and the people who populated your, your novel. What's your name? Ed. Ed, Ed Kong. Ed Hong. Kong. It's, it's lovely. Han? Kong. Kong, I'm sorry. Um, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you for coming today. So Ed's question is, how did I get interested in the subject? Is that right? So I got interested in the subject because when I was 19 years old, I'm going to be 50 this year, and when I was 19, I went to a lecture where an American missionary was giving a talk about the Korean Japanese, I went under duress. I did not want to go because most 19-year-old college students have no interest in American missionaries who work in Japan. However, I'm really bad at saying no. And I went and it was 
my friend, Wilson, and me were very compliant. <laughs> and then it was the speaker, and it was the organizer, and there's four of us. Like, a, a, room, a room half this size. <laughs> so you can't leave, right? But there were a lot of cookies. And I'm easily mollified by carbohydrates. So I sat there and I figured 45 minutes, I'm a young person, it'll be fine. So I sat there and he was talking about the really tragic history of the Korean Japanese. And I was like, oh, this is really sad. I'm sorry to hear that. But then I was like, kind of like TikTok, I have to go see my boyfriend. And then <laughs> what ended up happening was he started to tell a story about a little boy in his parish, a 13-year-old boy, and he had climbed up to his apartment building and he jumped off to his death. He was Korean Japanese and he was born in Japan. And I was really surprised. And the minister, the missionary, who was a pastor, said that the parents went through all of his things and they found a middle school yearbook. And in the middle school yearbook, they found that his Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong. I hate you. You smell like kimchi. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And I was really so struck by this story. I just really couldn't believe it. And it sort of burned into my brain. And I graduated from college as a history major. I went to law school because I'm an immigrant. And <laughs> when I quit, I did decide to write fiction. And I thought I would give it a try because I had $15,000 saved. And that's a lot of money. <laughs> For me, from my background, I grew up working class, so I was like $15,000, like a gazillion dollars, right? So I figured, oh, I'm gonna write that book and I'm gonna make a lot of money because we're so rich, right? Yeah, we're like rolling in money right now <laughs> because writers are so wealthy. Anyway, I'm such an idiot. Like when, when I think back to how stupid I was, it's like, it's really quite stunning. But going back to your question, I got really interested in the subject and I wrote an entire book between 96 to 2003 about these people and they're not, my people technically in the sense that I, I'm not Korean Japanese, I'm Korean American. But I think that thing that really struck me was when I was a kid in America and I was a foreigner, people in Elmhurst, Queens were incredibly good to me. So I think I felt a sense of indignation that children could hate children in this way. And I think there's a part of me as a writer, and I think we writers are really obsessed with justice. It's, I think it's one of the common things you can, most writers, not all writers, most writers are very progressive and we want to fix things. And I think that in our pages we could fix things that we can't fix in life. So I think Pachinko is my solution to the puzzle of how could children hate each other. And it may seem like the weird thing to do because it is an entire history, but in order to understand the child who is hated today, because sound trucks, and right-wing Japanese today throw things at kindergarten children who, are, who go to North Korean schools in Japan today. And whenever I read, the, you can just like Google this in Japan Times, you know, to see the persecution of the North Korean Japanese kids in Japan. I still feel this sense of rage, but then I had to figure out how do I make it into art? Because rage is not that interesting in fiction. So that's my long answer. <laughs> I have a follow-up question. Um, so uh, I immigrated too late to go to law school, so I basically had no, <laughs> nothing to do but just write. Um, I was 28 when I came to the United States, so I was, you were 28. Yeah, I was oh, done. I, I was done know. for basically. I did not. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, and as hard as I tried to steer my child to go to law school, he's drawing comic books. Oh God. Um, <laughs> Um, at a university, <laughs> at a good university. <laughs> um, so, so my so follow-up question I had is, uh, what I run into in this country is the this pervasive desire to unsee one another um, that. Um, leads to so much continuing segregation and racial violence. Um, and so here you are 
writing, I have a paperback, it's almost 500 pages. Mm -hmm. um, this astonishing, compelling novel that is about people who are very different from your audience. Um, That's why I thought it wouldn't publish. Like, I was pretty sure no one would ever buy it because I was like, who cares about these 600,000 people? In the same way, like, you and I are writing about these obscure people that nobody obscure really... to right. our audience. Right? Exactly. Yeah. But to the Western world, nobody cares. I mean, technically, they don't care. I mean, right now, as you know, the Rohingya Muslims, a million of them are dispossessed. Nobody gives a shit. The entire country of Venezuela is starving to death. Nobody seems to give a shit. And a part of me is like furious, and I think, okay, but that's not that interesting as art. So how do we create empathy, right? Mm -hmm. And I do think that it is in these works, if you and I can calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, calm down, Benjamin. <laughs> right? really. But there is a part of me that just feels like, wow, how could we let this happen, right? Like, how could we literally overfish? How could we dispossess all these people of their livelihoods? How can we pollute this environment in this way? I mean, it's really quite striking. And I think it has to be done in this beautiful narrative in order to make us care and to be open. And I do think that's what fiction and nonfiction can do if it's well done. I, I do believe that. I'm very romantic in that way. Yeah, me too. And I think, you know, f for me, apart from the fact that this, uh, you know, novel of microaggressions and not microaggressions and real torture scenes like what you read just now or the 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 scene early on where pastor shen is uh you know trying to convert that's just a, such a brutal six or seven pages um the idea that we are able to reach an audience and you are re able to reach an audience this the fact that this this book is so beautifully received oh, by people who may not know how to pronounce the names of the people in the novel gives me a tremendous heart because even in our unseeing and desire to nobody, everybody, right? To nobody, the people who don't look like us, don't Can sound like us. Can I ask you like a question us. about this? Yeah. This is really important because thank you for what you said, but do you think, this is really important because you actually have produced all these great books. Do you think you. that people are good? Um, One sentence answer, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, yeah. there's really no right answer, but I would just like, I would love to know that because you must have a lot of hope. Yeah. Right? I do. I, I do have a lot of hope. I think that people carry everything that each of us is capable of tremendous acts of kindness and tremendous acts of violence. And I've been thinking a lot about how we compartmentalize compassion. The more informed we are about what's happening in the world, the more we decide to choose that we're going to allocate compassion to just the migrants in the Mediterranean Sea or just you know this cause. Or, or just children. Just children, or just, just yeah. that. And, and I'm trying to figure out why do we think that compassion is a finite resource, is an infinite, is a finite resource? Why do we think that if I, you know, if I give compassion to to this cause, um, then I don't have compassion to spend on anything else? And I'm coming to this conclusion that, and especially in the Western world, as this is a very problem-solving culture, so we want to allocate compassion and then follow up and then solve things. And we have no emotional language, no emotional vocabulary for shame and uh, impotence that comes with compassion that we allocate to things that we can't solve, like people dying in the Mediterranean Sea, like people dying of starvation, like people dying of war, like people, you know. And, and so we choose to turn our compassion away from that because we're so ashamed that we can't fix it. And I think that you know, literature, good liter literature like this novel can help maybe open up a, this is where my, hope, my hopeful thing comes in, um, maybe can hope open up a space of compassion for something that is unsolvable. Mm. F for, for me, unsolvable in this moment and yet and yet I have compassion for it. 
So it's kind of a reminder that I don't have to actually parse, parse out um, my love and my compassion just to what I know how to fix, wow. including your washing machine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to get this young lady here, but could you answer your own question also? I mean, oh, what do you think? Do I think people are good? Yeah. I actually think most people are good. I do. But I think we're capable of tremendous evil. And I believe in evil. I believe that something like evil exists. Like I believe in sin. I believe in, but I also believe in grace. I believe in goodness. So, but all those things. And as a matter of fact, it's very disturbing because I keep meeting people who are fantastic, who are so shitty too. So I get really upset. And I think that as I get older, I, I realize that that's part of my job to accept that range of human ability <laughs> to be both fantastic and to be so horrid. <laughs> and this comes up with racism all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, th that happened to me enormously so often in Japan where somebody who could be Japanese could be just just salt of the earth, so perfect in so many ways, spent almost their, their entire lives doing good things. And then once in a while, just like, let out these in, insane statements about Koreans. And I'm going, oh God, <laughs> what do I do with you? I so appreciate that you feed the poor. Mm -hmm. But then you could say things about my blood that I'm somehow contaminated. Mm -hmm. But both were true. His life was dedicated to helping the poor. <laughs> He did more work than I ever did. Like I might have had correct thoughts, but he was doing the work. And I really respect that. So um, I also have a question for Min Jin. Um, I, I loved your book, and you. I was trying to think about how to talk my mother into reading it. And what I told her is, you will love this book because there is a character who is like the Korean Rhett Butler. And so I kind of <laughs> sold her on, on Hansu in that way. And, and she loved it. Uh, she couldn't put your book down. So I know that you did lots of research with, um, uh, with folks who are like him in Asia, but I wonder if you ever thought of Rhett Butler when you were writing that character. I did. <laughs> did you? Um, Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell won the Pulitzer. It is a fantastic book. Like even now, as a, as a child, I read it. And I remember thinking when I wrote Free Food for Millionaires in terms of form, forming Casey and Ella, I did think about the dichotomy between Melanie and Scarlett. And Red Butler is alluring, absolutely. I mean, he's a sexist dog and a horrible person. However, he's really alluring. So that's, right. So you've got that Hansa character. And Caroline Kennedy said something similar about it. So if you look at the paperback in the introduction, she talks about how Hansu actually is all these famous male characters in fiction. But yes, I like On With The Wind. I think the movie is something entirely a different work. But the novel is really quite fantastic. <laughs> I think we could do this all night, but unfortunately, they'll turn the lights out on us. Um, <laughs> before you join us upstairs for the book signing, ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause for Anna Bodkin and Men Jin Lee.